Go. Hi guys, Dr. Dan Nightingale here, your clinical dementia specialist. I hope you're having a great day, a great week. I certainly am. I'm going to talk about one of my quotes that uh, was po posted on Facebook and Instagram lately. And the actual quote is, keep a communication book for sharing memories with people living with dementia. So I'm going to widen that topic a little bit because communication is a, an absolutely crucial part of supporting somebody to live well with dementia. Sometimes, and this isn't always, it depends on the type of dementia an individual has, it depends on the stage of the journey the person is at, but sometimes communication becomes a challenge. We're led to believe that if somebody loses the ability to vocalise, then their ability to communicate is compromised. Well, it is a little bit. There is some truth to that, especially if somebody has expressive or receptive dysphasia or aphasia, which means sometimes they don't understand what you are saying to them, or sometimes they don't have the ability to express what they want to say to you. So that, that sometimes happens. So what I want to get across to people is that body language and tone of voice and facial expression is paramount. We must bring it to the forefront of our support strategies when we are supporting somebody to live well with their, um, their challenges, okay? So body language accounts for around about 73% of all our communication. Whatever you're doing and wherever you are, you are always reading other people's body language or other animals' body language. Is this person going to attack me? Is, am I safe with this person? Is this dog safe? Is this um, horse safe? We're always reading body language, but we're reading it at a, con at a subconscious level. Not everybody is able to interpret it. So if you think about people who work in airports, security staff, some of those guys have been trained specifically to focus on body language. And they can watch somebody walking through the airport terminal and they can know from reading their body language, whether they are carrying drugs, whether they are carrying uh, prohibited foodstuffs, whether they're carrying money that they shouldn't be carrying. So body language is absolutely crucial. And somebody who is living with dementia, once their Broca's and Wernick's area become dysfunctional, which is responsible for speech and language, it doesn't affect their ability to read body language. So ensure your body language is always open, open posture, relaxed, non-threatening, Smile, um, be, be warm, be genuine, and you keep your tone at a level that the person can hear. So it's, it's like the, there's three C's that I like to call it. Be clear, be concise, and be consistent. So if you know that somebody has difficulty understanding certain language and certain words and sentences and phrases, choose the words, the language and the phrases that the person can respond to. And you might have to support that with body language or with signing or with um, cards. Or touching. Or touch. Yeah. Um, so just make sure that you use all those, all those mediums for communication. And Clear, concise, consistent. Consistency is that everybody uses exactly the same phrase, the same words, the same term, the same, the same sentence, in the same tone. So don't deviate from that language. Everybody use the same. The same body language, the same tone, and the same words. Okay? Uh, might be necessary to use symbols, signs. 
it might be necessary to you i mean don't don't forget some people who are living with dementia are also unable to hear which has been a lifetime thing for them so they use sign language this is something we might have to use you might have to use american sign language or british sign language or makaton whichever sign language the person uses and i think it's also important here to bring in the fact that some people who have developmental disabilities and who have gone on to develop dementia later on in life need a totally different approach in terms of communication so just bear that in mind if you are supporting somebody who has autism and alzheimer's disease somebody with down syndrome and alzheimer's disease you're, you're gonna have to change around a little bit um, use a different approach different techniques different models different modes of communication but at the end of the day it it's all about the car approach you know the nightingale car approach which if you've read my book you will know that it's in there um, which is all about communication attitude and response so bear those things in mind when you are communicating with somebody use everything and anything that you can that helps that individual no matter how ridiculous it might look or how ridiculous you might think it is you know, if you have to leave post-it notes in various places around the house, if you have to leave notes on the mirror, if you have to use a whiteboard, a communication book, if you have to use a storyboard, it's all fine. Use whatever you can to improve communication for that individual, because at the end of the day, we are trying to ensure that that person has a good quality of life. Lynn. Hi, um, oh, I know a lot of your patients have hearing aids. That adds a whole nother level. How do you communicate with those patients as a doctor and how do their loved ones communicate as they progress along the journey? Yeah, good question. Good question. Very much the same. We have to, as we always say, we meet the person where they are at. So what is it that's helping you? What works best for you with your hearing issue or your visual impairment? at this stage of your of your journey so we would use whatever we can if somebody's wearing hearing aids it's important that those hearing aids are kept clean it's important that the batteries are kept correct it's important that the person uses them because many many times um, i'll see patients who have hearing aids but don't wear them so that makes it a consultation difficult so ensure they're wearing them. And the other thing is make sure they're in properly. Um, we've got different hearing aids today, modern, modern day hearing aids. Some of them you can't see, they're in there. You don't see them. Um, they're in there permanently, you don't see them. So we've got to rely on that person then to tell us there's something wrong with, the, with this. Um, I know somebody who had them fitted, they're permanent but something went wrong with one of them so they had to go back to audiology and audi audiology had to repair it fix it sort it out so brilliant question that lynn just make sure of those things they're clean they're fitted properly they work the batteries are right and the right volume as well because you know with the um the, the less modern hearing aids the ones that sit on the ear and they have the little switch here they start buzzing and making bizarre um, noises. It happened to me last week, actually, on a house call with somebody who wears hearing aids. He was having real issues with the right one. He, he kept hearing buzzing noises. So um, that warranted, I guess, a trip this week, organised to go to audiology to, to get it sorted out. So good question. Thank you. Yeah, and also that makes me think... Um you should make sure that your loved one, if they do wear contacts or glasses for being yeah. able to see better, so, that you don't ignore yeah. the fact that they still need to get their eyes checked regularly to make mm -hmm. sure that their prescription is correct and adequate. Yeah. They may not know to tell you, so mm -hmm. you have to stay on top of yeah. that. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, anything that you can use to enhance that communication 
two-way, because of course communication is a two-way thing or a three-way thing or a four-way thing. It's not just a one a one person thing. So good good observation, Lynn. Thank you. So there you go. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. I'm gonna leave it there. Um, just ask you to share this video with anybody who's going to need it. More or less everybody today knows somebody who is living with dementia or somebody who is looking after somebody who is living with dementia. So share this resource. It's free. Get them to subscribe to the YouTube channel. All my videos, there's, there's I don't know now, there's going up for like 200 videos or something. Long videos, short videos. Um, quotes, comments, statements, and all kinds of things on YouTube, on my Facebook page and my Instagram page. So follow me, subscribe to the channel, share it with everybody. The more people we educate, the better it is worldwide. So thanks for tuning in. And just before we go, remember guys, it's very hot. We're in the middle of summer. Please drink plenty of water. Please make sure that if you're supporting somebody who's living with dementia, that they drink sufficient amounts of water. The biggest cause of hospital admission is dehydration and uh, UTIs because of dehydration. People fall, people um, get uh, petty fogged, they, they get more confused. And so just water, water, water. And I know some people are very, very difficult and very confrontational about drinking sufficient water but just push it just push it push the fluids make them drink it and remember guys say it with me dump the soda